The Battle of Massacred, Military Disaster or Political Failure by Paul Markham On the 26th of August 1071, an army under the command of the Byzantine Emperor Romanus IV, Diogenes, was defeated on the borders of Armenia by the army of the Seljuk Turkish Sultan Alp Arslan. Since that time, historians have identified the Battle of Massacred as the mortal blow that led to the inevitable collapse of the Byzantine Empire. How accurate is this interpretation? Was the loss of Anatolia the results of Romanus IV Diogenes' failed military campaign against the Seljuks, or was it a political failure of his predecessors or successors? This story examines Romanus Massacre's campaign and the significance of his defeat, and assesses whether the Byzantine position in Anatolia was recoverable, and if so, why that recovery failed. Before Massacre, the Byzantine Empire in the 11th century. The mid 11th century was the high water mark of the Byzantine Empire. The successive reigns of the military emperors of the Macedonian dynasty had pushed the boundaries of the empire to the furthest geographical extent since Justinian the Great had reconquered Italy and North Africa in the 6th century. The empire now stretched from Dalmatia in the west, incorporating the whole of the Balkans, to Antioch in Syria in the south and all of Anatolia to Armenia in the east. The Byzantine recovery had been a long time coming. The 7th century had seen the drastic dismemberment of the empire. In the west, the Balkans and most of Greece had been lost to the Slavs. The Byzantines maintaining a toehold in eastern Thrace, Thessalonica and scattered outposts on the Dalmatian coast. In the east, Syria, Palestine, Egypt and Africa had been permanently lost to the Arabs. The loss of these valuable provinces triggered the rampant inflation that caused the virtual collapse of monetary economy during the reign of Constance II. The crisis led to two permanent changes within the empire. The old Roman provinces were restructured into smaller administrative units called Thema, under the administration of military governor Strategos, and the assignment lands grants to the soldier in place of paying wages. The empire also faced an energetic and expansionist challenger in the Umayyad Caliphate. Larger and far more prosperous than the rump Byzantine Empire, the Umayyad Caliphate had sufficient resources to envisage the complete conquest of the empire. The Umayyads made two serious attempts to conquer the empire, laying siege to Constantinople in 674 till 678 AD and again in 717 AD. Fortunately for Byzantium, the Umayyad Caliphate was overthrown in 750 AD by the Abbasids, who gave up such ambitious plans, opting instead for regular military campaigns that sometimes penetrated right into the heart of the Byzantine Anatolia. These raids culminated in Caliph Mutasim's destruction of Amorium in central western Anatolia in 838 AD. By the end of the 8th century, however, Byzantium's situation began to improve. With inflation checked and the currency stabilized, the Byzantine economy slowly began to recover. And after the Empress Irene secured a long-standing peace with the Abbasid Caliphate in 782 AD, trade between the two empires resumed, much to Byzantium's advantage. Peace in the east allowed Irene to turn her attention to the west. There, the Slavic tribes of the interior had become increasingly integrated with the Byzantine enclaves along the coast and a short military campaign in 784 AD was sufficient to recover the land route between Constantinople and Thessaloniki, which until that time had been accessible only by sea. By the reign of Michael III, the balance of power between the Byzantines and the Abbasid Caliphate had shifted significantly. The Abbasid economy was in decline and the government paralyzed by the religious and political factionalism. The Byzantines exploited Abbasid's disunity to take the offensive and over the course of two centuries recovered their lost provinces of Illyricum, Greece, Bulgaria, Northern Syria, Cilicia and Armenia. Byzantine expansionism reached its peak with Constantine IX Monomachus, annexation of the Armenian city of Ani in 1045 AD. Yet at the same time as Constantine was celebrating Ani's annexation, a new player in the international affairs arrived on the scene, the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuk Turks, 
For centuries, the Caliphate had been a bulwark against the southwesterly immigration of the nomadic tribes of Central Asia. Progressive waves of nomads were diverted northwards across the Russian steppes and around the Caspian and Black Seas. Before emerging in the Danube Basin, nomadic migrations were monitored and reported by the Byzantine outpost in Cherson in the Crimea, which usually gave Constantinople sufficient notice to bring its power of diplomacy to bear. As Constantine the Seventh, the Administrando Imperium makes clear, there was no shortage of tribes around the Black Sea who could be encouraged or bribed to deny passage to the nomads. However, with the Caliphate in disarray, there was no effective force to stop the immigration of Central Asian nomads. In 1040 AD, the first Seljuk horsemen penetrated the Caliphate's eastern border and, without encountering any effective Abbasid opposition, began plundering their way across Iran and Iraq. They soon crossed into Armenia and drove deep into Anatolia, reaching the Byzantine port city of Trebizond on the Black Sea coast in 1054 AD. The following year, the Abbasids bowed to the inevitable and conceded political and military authority to Tugrul Bey of the Great Seljuks. Tugrul was granted the title of Sultan and took Baghdad as his capital. Suddenly, the Seljuks were elevated from nomadic raiders to masters of a vast and sophisticated empire. The Byzantine response The annexation of Armenia was a strategic disaster for the Byzantines. In 1022 AD, the Emperor Basil II had forced the Armenian king John Sinbad III to cede Ani to Basil if he died without direct heirs. When he died in 1040 AD, there were still plenty of claimants to the throne and Armenia quickly degenerated into chaos. John Sinbad's nephew, Gagik II, seized the city in 1040 AD and held it against all challenges. The Armenian historian Vardapid Aristakis Lastovich relates with copious tears. In these days, Byzantine armies entered the land of Armenia four times in succession until they had rendered the whole country uninhabited through sword, fire and captive taking. In an attempt to destabilize the Armenians, Constantine the Knight secretly encouraged the Seljuks to attack Ani in 1044 AD. Gagik eventually agreed to abdicate and was rewarded with titles, honors and lands in Cappadocia. Unfortunately, he would not have long to enjoy them. Although fractions, the Armenian princes provided a secure buffer zone on the Byzantine's eastern border, now the Byzantines came into direct contact with the Seljuks whose fighting style of mobile horse archery they were unfamiliar with. Nor could the Byzantines rely on the Armenians for support. One of Constantine's first acts after the fall of Ani was to instigate a purge of the monophysite clergy of Armenian church. Fleeing war and persecution, a mass exodus began, including the Armenian troops. The Byzantines relied on the garrison, the border fortresses, Many now sought their fortunes elsewhere, some in Persia, some in Greece, some in Georgia. Some Armenian troops joined the Seljuk bands that now began raiding across the Armenia border. Constantine the Knight made no attempt to stop the Seljuk raids before he died in 1055 AD. Constantine's successor Michael VI Bringas, although portrayed as weak and elderly, attempted to rally the defense. Michael was clearly unhappy with the chaos ensuing on the Armenian frontier and during the Easter Holy Week celebrations when the Empire's leading generals and public servants attended an audience with the Emperor, he berated them saying, either go forth in war against the Persians and prevent the land from being ruined or else I shall pay the Persians your stipends and thus keep the lands in peace. The two leading generals of the East Katakalon Kosemnus and Isaac Komnenus were singled out for particular criticism. Michael's stinging rebuke did little to resolve the crisis on the Armenian front, as within a month the army of the East had re risen in, in rebellion and proclaimed Isaac Komnenus emperor. The rebellion of the army of the East against Michael VI is often portrayed as a conflict between the military and civil factions within Byzantine government.
In fact, it reveals a deeper East versus West division within the Empire. The Army of the West remained loyal to Michael and fought hard in its defense outside Nicaea on 20th August 1057 AD. Contemporary historians claim the slaughter was considerable and although Michael's army was forced to withdraw, Isaac could not claim victory with certainty. Michael, however, was overthrown in a palace coup and abdicated in, a, in favor of Isaac Comnenus. Although Michael's reign is portrayed as little more than a byline in Byzantine history, understanding why the Western armies remained loyal to him is important to explain what happened after Manzikert. Irene's reconquest of Hellas and Thrace in 784 AD had been a simple affair largely because the bubonic plague and the Slavic invasion of the 7th century had left the provinces largely depopulated. Nicephorus I attempted to solidify the Byzantine hold on these territories by offering subsidies and tax incentives to encourage the resettlement. The military aristocracy financial interest were centered on Anatolia and showed little interest in Rumelia. The newly ascendant civil bureaucracy, however, were largely excluded from investing in Anatolia and began buying up estates in the west. Effectively splitting the empire into an old money, Anatolian party and a new money, Western bureaucratic party. As a career civil servant, it is likely that Michael Bringas was among the many courtly investors who established estates in the West, which may explain both the reason the courier faction selected Michael as their candidate, and for the support he seems to have enjoyed in the West. The Unraveling of the Byzantines' Eastern Policy The Byzantine Civil War was a disaster. As soon as the Seljuks realized that the Byzantine nobles were fighting and opposing one another, they boldly arose and came against us ceaselessly raiding, destructively ravaging. Although an energetic general, Isaac Comnenus proved equally unable to stop the Seljuk raiders who in 1075 AD destroyed the city of Melitene on the Mesopotamian frontier. Isaac realized that a complete overhaul of both the army and the administration was required. But he had a few allies in Constantinople and his attempts at reform came to nothing. When Isaac died in 1059 AD, the courier faction secured the election of their candidate. Constantine X Ducas, although a member of the Anatolian military aristocracy, Constantine dedicated his reign to internal legal reform while neglecting the defense of the empire. As the Byzantine economy began to flounder, Constantine cut costs by cashiering thousands of native troops which only accelerated the Byzantine collapse in the east. In 1064 AD, the Seljuks captured and sacked Ani. Byzantine Defense Strategy Ani was a critical to the Byzantine Eastern Defense Strategy. Byzantine Defensive Strategy was based on the position of the key fortified positions, which in the event of invasion were expected to hold out until relieved, or the enemy withdrew. It was a strategy of calculated risk, sometime with disastrous results. After the Arab victory at the Battle of Yarmouk in 636 AD, the Emperor Heraclius ordered what remained of the Byzantine forces in Syria to withdraw to fortified positions and hold until relieved. The promised relief never eventuated, however, and the isolated garrisons were progressively forced to surrender. The Byzantines' defense of Syria and Egypt had been hamstrung by overextended lines of supply and communication and a lack of defensible fallback positions. Within the Anatolian plateau, however, the situation was quite different as the Byzantines had a network of careful prepared defensive positions, and because the cold, wind-swept steppes of the plateau were largely unsuitable for settled ag agriculture, it was difficult for an invading army.
which relied on plunder for its supply to sustain itself in the field. Nevertheless, while a static defense may have been effective against the abbasid field armies of the 8th century, it was ineffectual against mobile Turkish raiders who, finding Anatolian steppes almost indistinguishable from their Central Asian homeland, were able to rove at will and live off the meagre resources of the land. Romanus IV and the legacy of Basil II Constantine X died in 1067 AD, leaving the administration in the hands of his wife Idusia as regent for their son Michael Dukas. Idusia Makrembolitissa was a strong and intelligent woman and in stark contrast to her husband. She recognized the loss of Annie, a massive gap had opened up in the chain of fortifications running from Kars to Edessa through which Seljuk raiders could penetrate right into the heart of Anatolia. Decisive military action was required. Edusia's ability to direct government policy, however, was severely restricted by the influence of the powerful Ducas clan. Dominated by Constantine's brother John Ducas, discreetly Edusia cast about for an ally to counterbalance the Ducas and eventually settled on Romanus Diogenes. Romanus was in his mid-thirties, a member of Cappadocian military family, and currently under the sentence of death for his part in a rebellion against Constantine X, his lack of connections in Constantinople was probably a factor in Eudusia's choice, for it ensured that Romanus had no independent constituency to threaten Eudusia's interests. Romanus, for his part, swore to be her servant in all things and uphold the rights of leg legitimate heir, Michael Dukas. To the horror of the Dukas faction, Idusia and Romanus were married and Romanus immediately set about revitalizing an army largely neglected since the death of Basil II in 1025 AD. Romanus' immediate predecessors cannot be held entirely to blame for the mediocre state of the Byzantine army in the mid-11th century. The policies of the military emperors of the 10th century were also a contributing factor in the Byzantine's military decline. Historically, Byzantium had relied on defense in depth rather than stationing large garrisons of troops along Byzantium's borders. Three professional armies, Khaled Tagmata, were stationed in Western Anatolia, Constantinople and Thrace, where they could be quickly mobilized in response to an invasion. Every city in the empire ha also had a garrison of local troops for defense and policing actions. These thematic troops were not full-time soldiers, but were farmer soldiers who received a grant of land in return for periodic service. In order to meet the needs of Byzantium's aggressive foreign policy, Nicephorus II, John Simises, and Basil II changed the Tagmata from a rapid response, primarily defensive, citizen's army into a professional campaigning army, increasingly manned by mercenaries. Mercenaries, however, were expensive and as the threat of an invasion receded in the 10th century, so did the need for maintaining large garrisons and expensive fortifications. In order to save money to finance his Syrian campaigns, Nicephorus II Pocas cashiered many thousands of garrison troops and allowed the fortifications of many Anatolian cities to fall into disrepair. All Nicephorus' successors up to Constantine X continued this policy. Basil II spent most of his 50-year reign on campaign and conquered a massive amount of territory. And although he left a burgeoning treasure upon his debt, he did so at the expense of neglecting domestic affairs and ignoring the cost of incorporating his conquest into the Byzantine Ecumene. He also failed to plan for his succession and left the empire to his worthless brother and co-emperor Constantine VIII. None of Basil's immediate successors had any particular military or political talent and the governing of the empire increasingly fell into the hands of the civil service. The efforts to spend the Byzantine economy back into prosperity only resulted in burgeoning inflation and a debased gold coinage. In an effort to balance the increasingly unstable budget, Basil's large standing army was seen as both an, an unnecessary expense and a political threat, as underemployed troops became to focus of sedition. Native troops were cashiered and replaced by foreign mercenaries on specific contracts. The Massacre Campaign 1025-1030
Romanus did not immediately confront the Turks in Armenia, choosing instead the, to personally lead the army on a campaign in Syria in 1068 AD. The next year he led a campaign into Armenia, but the Turkish forces were simply too elusive to be drawn into a pitch battle. The historian and courier Michael Psellus, whose plotting on behalf of the Dukas clan led to his being forced to join the campaign, unfairly slanders Romanus by accusing him of not knowing where he was marching nor what he was going to do. Nevertheless, this campaign provided a valuable opportunity to improve the operational efficiencies of the army. Romanus' failure to crush the Turks led to open plotting by Dukas fashion and by 1070 AD, Romanus' position in Constantinople was so precarious that he was unable to leave the capital. Romanus entrusted that year's campaign to Manuel Komnenus, elder brother of the future emperor Alexius Komnenus. Unfortunately, the campaign ended in a debacle when Manuel was defeated and captured by a band of Turks. Surprisingly, Manuel convinced his captors to release him and defect to the Byzantines. Romanus rewarded the Turks with honors and titles and enlisted into his army. Manuel's coup allowed Romanus to regain some political capital, but it wasn't enough. Romanus needed a decisive victory not only to protect Armenia but also his throne. In the summer of 1071 AD, Romanus decided to gamble everything on a massive eastern campaign that would draw the Seljuks into a general engagement with the Byzantine army. All contemporary historians commented on the size of the army. Matthew of Edessa absurdly claims the Byzantine army exceeded 1 million men, while Vaderpert describes a countless host. The army itself consisted of the eastern and western tagmatas, mercenary units, Armenian conscripts and the private levies of the Anatolian landholders, along with the siege engines, sappers, engineers and the Romanus will need to recover the Armenian fortresses recently lost to the Turks. All told, the army probably amounted to about 40,000 effective fighting men. However, with the presence of the thousands of non-combatants, servants, baggage handlers and camp followers that always traveled with the medieval armies, the army would undoubtedly have appeared larger. Despite the failure of Manuel Komnenus in 1069 AD campaign, the Sultan of the Great Seljuks Alparslan had been quick to seek a peace treaty with the Byzantines. Alparslan had inherited the Abbasids' very respect for Byzantine's military power and at any rate regarded the Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt as his main enemy. He had no desire to engage the Byzantines in unnecessary hostilities. Under the terms of the treaty, Alparslan had committed to preventing the such raiding on Byzantine territory. Unfortunately, despite his grand title, Alparslan was, no, was in no position to control the Seljuk raiders. Most of the Seljuk clans still lived according to their Central Asian nomadic traditions and tended to acknowledge the Sultan's authority only when they were forced to or it suited their interests. Their raiding and constant feuding made them as much as nuisance to the great Seljuks as to their neighbors. So to preserve order, the most unruly Turkmen clans were pushed to the borders of the Sultanate where they could be encouraged to raid and plunder infidel territory. Consequently, Seljuk raiding into Anatolia continued unabated. In February 1071 AD, Romanus sent an emissary to Alparslan to renew the Treaty of 1069 AD. Romanus' envoys reached the Sultan outside Edessa, which was besieging. Keen to secure his northern flank against the Byzantine attack, Alparslan happily agreed to the terms, abandoned the siege and immediately led his army south to attack Aleppo in Fatimid Syria. The offer to renew the peace treaty was a key element of Romanus' plan, distracting the Sultan long enough to allow Romanus to lead an army into Armenia and recover, recover the lost fortresses before the Seljuks had time to respond. Then, with his eastern border secure and his rear protected, Romanus will be in a perfect position to either attack the Seljuks army if it attempted to enter Anatolia through the Taurus Mountains to intercept him, or strike, strike deep into the heartland of the Sultanate down the Euphrates River Valley, as the Emperor Heracles had done in the 7th century. Either way, Romanus would hold the tactical advantage while Alpaslan would be out of position and vulnerable. 
By our standards, Romanov's offer to renew the treaty while at the same time preparing for a war was deceptive. But the use of deception in warfare was a skill that Byzantines prized very highly. Byzantine tactical manuals regularly recommended using ploys, deception and negotiation and to either avoid battle or gain advantage. Romanus envoys would undoubtedly have been charged to assess the strength of the Sultan army, the mood of the camp and the Sultan's enthusiasm for war. Satisfied that his ploy was successful, Romanus mastered his army outside Constantinople in March 1071. Romanus' army included contingents of Normans, Cumans, Turks, Bulgarians, Germans, Pechenegs, Byzantines, Armenians, Syrians, Varangians, Uz, and Russians. There was nothing unusual in the heterogeneous composition of the army. The Byzantine army was a prestige service and drew professional soldiers from all around the medieval world. As the army marched east, it continued to gather recruits. Bands of Turks who were happy enough to contract their services to the Byzantines. Unfortunately, it was not with the soldiery that the problems within Romanus' army lay. The, the loyalty of many of Romanus' officers was highly questionable, especially as there were members of the Ducas clan and their allies occupying key positions within the army. There appear to have been incidences of sabotage during the march, such as the destruction of his personal baggage train, which led Romanus to camp separately from the main army. By the time the army reached Armenia, tensions were running high. The Battle of Manzikert When the Byzantine army reached Theodosopolis in July, Romanus received reports that the news of his campaign had led the Sultan to abandon the siege of Aleppo and was withdrawing in some disorder towards the Euphrates. It appeared many of the Sultan's troops had deserted and he was now commanding a much reduced army of between 10 and 15,000 men. Romanus rejected the advice of some of his generals to evade the sieges of Theodopolis and ordered the army to advance on Manzikert in sieges held territory. Romanus expected the sieges would advance from the south, so when he reached Lake Wan in the late August, Romanus split his armies sending the Tecmata under General Joseph Tarconatus to secure the southern road to Kilat and protect it against the Sajuk attack, while he headed east to besiege Manzikert. At the sight of the Byzantine army, Manzikert's Turkish garrison immediately surrendered and the Romanus settled down to await news from Tarconatus. Romanus' intelligence about Arsene's flight from Aleppo had been correct. The Sultan had learned of Romanus' campaign from Romanus' own envoys and the news had its desired effect. The Sultan immediately recognized the danger, raised the siege and hurried towards Armenia. Because Aleppo was a wealthy city offering attractive opportunities for plunder, the Sultan had been able to raise a large army, but a campaign against the Byzantine army in Armenia offered no such incentive. And as a advanced towards Armenia, his army began to melt away. By the time he reached the Euphrates River, he was left with only about 10,000 men. By forced marches, Arslan reached Armenia in late August. He had managed to recruit additional troops on the way, but his army was probably only half the size of Romanus. The Sechuks did have one advantage over the Byzantines though. They had good intelligence. Roving Sajuk horsemen fed the Sultan a constant stream of reports of the Byzantine army progress. Unlike Romanus, Arslan knew exactly where his enemy was and planned his response accordingly. While Romanus was busy besieging Manzikert, Tachinator's army encountered a strong Sajuk force advancing from the south. Without advising Romanus, Tachinator chose not to engage and withdraw his forces to the west. His troops took no part in subsequent battle and returned to Constantinople. Unaware of the desertion of half his army, Romanus encountered the main Sajik army on 24th August 1071 and immediately joined battle. The battle was to last two days. The first day involved a hard-fought battle between Sajik forces and a column of the Western Tagmata under Nikephorus Briennius. Briennius managed to extricate his forces and withdraw in order but a relief column under the Dew of Theodosiopolis, Nikephorus Basileikis, was ambushed and Basileikis was captured. Determined to draw 
that such as into a general engagement, Romanus drew up all his forces for battle on the second day. Romanus followed textbook strategic planning. He commanded the central with the Varangian guard and a large body of mercenaries. Briennes commanded the left wing, Theodore Alietes commanded the right wing. Turkish and Uz auxiliaries provided a light cavalry screened on each wing. A reserve force under Andronicus Dukas followed at discreet distance behind the main column. The Sechuk army formed a broad crescent in front of the Byzantine position. Alp Arslan commanded from a nearby hilltop where he could survey the field of the battle. Romanus initiated the battle by beginning a slow advance. The Sechuks poured arrows into the Byzantine ranks and retired as they advanced. Skirmishing occurred between the wings of both armies but neither side gained any advantage. Towards dusk, Romanus called a halt to advance and began an orderly withdrawal back to the camp. As the Byzantines began to reverse direction, the Seljuks launched a fierce attack against the wings. The Byzantine right wing, which had been particularly hard pressed during the advance, broke in confusion. At this point, the reserve force under Andronicus Ducas should have come to the aid of the emperor but instead turned and withdrew from the field. Sparking a general rout, the left wing under Nicephorus Briennius fought its way clear but the center, including Romanus, was overwhelmed and captured. Byzantine troop losses Later historians such as Alfred Friendly, Edward Ford and John Norwich have left us with the impression that the Byzantine army was annihilated at massacre. Although it was a momentous battle, contemporary Byzantine and Armenian narratives indicate that most of the army was either not present, deserted or withdrew before the final collapse. It is notoriously difficult to assess casualties from medieval sources, who tend to use exaggerated death tolls as a moral device. Nevertheless, we are able to make a general ass assessment of Byzantine losses at Manzikert based on historical troop sizes and what we know of the fate of the various participants. Number 1. Tashinaitis army of approximately 20,000 troops, including the most of the Tegmata, did not engage the Turks at all and had withdrawn towards Constantinople before the battle. Number 2. Russell de Belus, 500 strong Norman contingent, which were scouting the road to Kilat, escaped virtually intact ahead of the main battle. Number 3. A contingent of approximately 1,000 Turkish Uz mercenaries defected on 25th August 2071 before the final battle. Number 4. Andronicus Dukas reserve forces of, up, of approximately 5,000, including most of the Anatolian Levites, deserted the battle ahead of the collapse. Number 5. The 5,000 troops of the left wing under Nicephorus Briennius managed to fight their way clear of the battle after the collapse. It, it would be reasonable to assume approximately 1,000 casualties, including losses from the first day's battle. Number 6. Romanus Diogenes and the Varangian Guard were defeated and captured. We must assume that the most of the Varangians were killed as Alpastan provided Romanus with a new escort of troops, although such a gesture was customary. Even so, no more than 500 Varangians can have present at Manzikert as there was still a Varangian contingent at Constantinople to acclaim Michael VIII Dukas. Number 7. A contingent of two to 3,000 Turkish mercenaries in the century remained loyal to the Romanians and was virtually annihilated. Number 8. The right wing, which mainly consisted of Armenian troops, was hard pressed throughout the battle and was the first to break so we must assume they were bore most of losses. We also know a contingent of Armenian troops on the wing deserted during the battle. Of the casualties and desertions, probably only, only one, a thousand troops escaped to Mazikert. Romanus had left the camp, the baggage and the non-combatants with only a token guarded. We know from Mike Atalaitis, who was the secretary on Romanus' staff, that survivors from both the right wing and the reserve warned the camp of Romanus' defeat which was immediately abandoned to the enemy. Because the battle was fought in the late afternoon, it was dusk by the time the Turks reached their camp, allowing the survivors to escape under the cover of darkness to the safety of nearby Manzikert. After Manzikert Although Manzikert was a serious blow to the Byzantine prestige, Romanus' position was in no way irrecoverable. 
Al Aslan treated Romanus with respect due to his position and imposed no harsh terms on the Byzantines. Although he had long campaigned on the Byzantine periphery, he had no intention of embarking on a full scale invasion of the empire. He also recognized that his victory at the Manzikat had been a narrow run thing. If Andronicus Duca's reserve force had not deserted, the battle would be very likely have had a different result. In a fictional speech written by a later Arab historian, Romanus, Romanus underlines the threat Al Paslan faced. Quote, Tell the Sultan to return me to the capital of my kingdom before the room agree on another emperor and he openly declares battle and war. End of court. If Aslan was to fulfill his ambition of conquering Fatimid Egypt, he could, he could not afford the risk of a war with the Byzantine. So it served his interest to have a grateful and subdued Romanus restored to the throne and his Byzantine borders secure. Romanus and Arslan negotiated a new peace treaty in which both sides agreed to a return to the status quo in exchange for a ransom of 1 million solidi and marriage alliance between Arslan's son and Romanus' daughter. Armenia would be restored to the Byzantines and, after the exchange of several disputed border fortresses, Arslan would endeavor to prevent further Sejuk incursions into Byzantine territory. Romanus remained at Arslan's camp for a week and was entertained as an honored guest. The Sultan released his prisoners and provided Romanus with, with gifts suitable to his rank, supplies and an armed escort. News of his defeat would undoubtedly have reached the capital, so it was imperative Romanus take steps to calm the situation. He hurriedly sent a report of his engagement to the Senate and gathering what troops he encountered on the way rushed back to Constantinople. In Constantinople, however, the Ducas faction used news of Romanus' defeat to stage a coup in favor of Michael Ducas. Although Michael was now 20 years old, he showed no capacity for governing and left affairs of state in the hands of his mother, who continued to act as regent on his behalf. The Empress Eudusia, however, remained aligned with Romanus, while the court debated what action to take. John Ducas rushed to Constantinople from exile in Bithynia and ordered the immediate arrest of the Empress. Romanus was declared deposed and Michael VII Ducas proclaimed sole emperor. John reinforced his own position by claiming the title Caesar and effectively became the power behind the throne. After learning of his day position, Romanus gathered his forces and marched on Constantinople. In late September or October, Romanus was defeated outside Amasia by an army under the command of Caesar John's youngest son, Constantine Ducas, forcing him to withdraw towards his native Cappadocia, where he hoped to winter and regroup his forces. But the following spring, his new army was engaged and defeated by troops under his erstwhile reserve commander, Andronicus Ducas. Realizing that his position was hopeless, Romanus agreed to surrender in return for a promise of safe conduct into exile. John, however, had him savagely blinded and he died shortly afterwards. Political Disaster Manziger was less an invitation for the Turks to invade than for the Byzantines to begin a civil war. The Emperor Michael inspired neither confidence nor loyalty and Caesar John proved as inca incapable of securing Anatolia against the Turks as his predecessors, which encouraged the Anatolian magnates to turn their back on the central government and see to their own defense. In northeast Anatolia, Theodora Gabra seized the area around Thersopolis and Trebizond, while in the north, southeast, and the Armenian general Philoretus Bracamius seized Byzantine Cilicia all the way from Edessa in the east to Antioch in the west. Theodore and Philoretus, under the troops at their disposal, to put up, to put up a stubborn defense and pushed the Turks back, but their efforts were uncoordinated and their frontier between their territories remained wide open. Despite the disorder in Anatolia, there was no such invasion. Alpaslan had respected his treaty with Romanus and, and at any rate died a year after his victory at Manzikert. His son and successor Malik Shah was too busy solidifying his rule in Iran to consider invading the Byzantine Empire and, like his father, had designed on Fatimid Egypt. What neither state could do at this time was prevent the Turkmen raiders, who recognized no authority from penetrating the Seljuk Byzantine border and raiding at will. The Turkmen were raiders of opportunity and simply bypassed areas of stiff resistance and pushed further and further west, 
One emir named Kutalamis raided Kayseri and Nixar in central Anatolia and penetrated as far west as Amorium without encountering Byzantine resistance. With the East in rebellion and virtually no loyal troops available to it, the Duke's government was forced to turn to the Norman and Turkish mercenaries. Norman heavy cavalry provided surprisingly effective against the Turks, but they were expensive and often hard to control. Having observed the Empire's weakness, First hand, many of harbored their own imperial ambitions. Russell de Valio, after a successful campaign against the Seljuks, rebelled against the Dukas and carved a dukedom for himself in eastern Armenia. While in the west, the Norman Duke of Apulia and Calabria, Robert Guscard, seized Byzantium's last Italian possession, Bari. The Norman contribution to the Byzantine army was relatively small, however, and confined to service in crack regiments such as the Immortals.
The majority of mercenary troops in the Byzantine army were Turks. The abundance of Turkish manpower, their fighting prowess, and their availability as troops for hire made them indispensable to both the central government and the Anatolian rebels. Caesar John used both Turkish and Norman troops in his campaign against Russell de Baleo in 1072 AD, but his Normans mutinied and, and handed him over to Russell, who then proclaimed John emperor and led their combined force against Constantinople. In response, Michael Dukas commissioned the young and talented Alexis Komnenus to lead an army of Turkish auxiliaries against the rebels. Through guilt and bribery, Alexis convinced John and Russell's Turks to arrest their erstwhile leaders and defect to Michael. In 1078 AD, the governor of Anatolic theme, Nikephoros Botanates, led a revolt against Michael Dukas. Lacking sufficient native troops for an assault against Constantinople, Botanates sought the support of the Seljuk Emir Suleiman ibn Ptolemis. As Botanates advanced on Constantinople at the head of a Turkish army, Nikephoros Brianus and Nikephoros Basileikos launched separate, separate and simultaneously revolts in the west. Michael Dukas realized his position was hopeless and abdicated becoming a monk. Botanates reached Constantinople first and was duty, duly proclaimed emperor. Botanates then sent Alexius Komnenus with another army of Turks to defeat Brianus and Basileikos. However, when his own kinsman Nikephoros Melisennus revolted against Botanates in 1081 AD, Alexius refused to fight and instead usurped the, the throne himself. The Byzantine civil war had continued for 10 years and completely exhausted Byzantine resources in Anatolia. While the Byzantines had been busy fighting each other, the Turks had advanced into a power vacuum, in, initially as raiders, later, later as mercenaries and finally as settlers. They had successfully exploited Byzantine factionalism by supporting various usurpers as their interests dictated and had profited immensely. By 1081 AD, the Seljuks occupied virtually the entire Anatolian plateau from Armenia in the east to Bithynia in the west and Suleiman occupied Nicaea as his nominal capital. Consolidation and neglect under Alexis Komnenus Alexis displayed an ambivalent attitude towards the collapse of the Byzantine position in Anatolia. It is true that Robert Guiscard posed the most immediate threat to his throne, but even after the Romans were defeated in 1084 AD, Alexis made no serious attempts to recover Anatolia. One of his first acts as emperor had been to write to those magnates still holding territory against the Turks, confirming them in their positions and bidding them to continue their resistance with all the resources of their disposal. It was a purely political act. Alexis could not forget that Anatolian magnates were potential rivals who needed to be placated while he faced Robert Guiscard. He then embarked on a brief campaign to clear the Bithynian coast of roving Turkish nomads before signing a peace treaty with Sultan Suleiman, by which the Sultan agreed to prevent further Turkish raiding west of the de facto border between their states. Alexis had very effectively redirected Turkish pressure away from his territory and against that of his Anatolian rivals. Relentless Turkish pressure would eventually make Philaretus' defense of Cilicia untenable and in 1086 AD he was overthrown by his son, who surrendered Antioch to Suleiman and became a Muslim. Similarly, Theodore Gabras would lose all the territory from Castamoni in western Paplagonia to Sinop in the east retaining only Trebizond as vassal of the Georgians. With his eastern frontier secure, Alexius turned to the west. As father-in-law to the legitimate heir to the throne, Constantine Ducas, Robert Guiscard had his own designs on the Byzantine throne and he rightly regarded Alexius as usurper. To protect his rights, in June 1081 AD, he landed an army on the Greek mainland and began besieging the city of Durecium. The imbalance between the Norman and Byzantine forces was marked. Guiscard was able to call on the substantial resources of Norman Italy and Sicily, as well call on the services of dissatisfied Byzantines and defectors. While Alexis was forever desperately short of cash and manpower, Alexis turned to Suleiman for assistance, who willingly supplied him with troops. In fact, Alexis' dependence on a constantly supply of Turkish manpower was underlined by his creation of two new units in the Byzantine army, the elite Vardaroids, Christianized Turks resettled to Rumelia, 
and the Turkopoloi, sons of the Turks. Alexius suffered three serious defeats at the hands of Rupert Guscard and his son, Bohemond. But Norman enthusiasm for the war was slowly worn down by a storm that sank their fleet in 1081 AD and an epidemic which swept through their army outside Durecium in 1082 AD, killing up to 10,000 men. When Robert Guiscard died in 1084 AD, Bohemond agreed a peace with Alexius and withdrew to Italy. Alexius' victory, however, did not bring him much political capital. He was still an usurper and he had funded his war with unpopular measures such as the confiscation of church, plate and the revelation of the gold coinage. Alexis was forced by necessity to turn his attention to domestic affairs, so securing peace in Anatolia was essential as part of settlement with the new Sultan Kilij Aslan. Alexis evacuated Byzantine refugees from Rome, Seljuk territory and resettled, resettled them in western Anatolia. He created a zone of devastated no man's land along the border between the states and established military settlements in key locations. Given Byzantium's economic and demographic situation, Alexius' decision makes sense. The Emperor Heraclius had done the same thing in the 7th century when he evacuated Syria, but it was also an admission that Byzantium had lost the Anatolian plateau. Anatolia as the Byzantine heartland, the interest of the landed elite. For almost two centuries since the near collapse of the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century, Anatolia had been the Byzantine heartland. However, this was less through choice than through necessity. Anatolia was a defensible bastion behind which the Byzantines were able to defend themselves against Arab invasion, but outside of the western coastal hinterland, Anatolia was not particularly fertile. After the creation of the Thema system in the 7th century, military necessity meant access to good land in Anatolia was restricted to the soldiery. Over time, the officers who were assigned larger estates came to take on the character of a military aristocracy. After the economic upturn of the 8th century, these aristocrats began buying up the lands of the smallholder soldier farmers. By the 10th century, the military aristocracy had grown so powerful they were able to challenge the powers of the emperor. The emperor Romanus I and Basil II sought to break the powers of the Magnates by enacting laws that banned the alienation of military lands. Basil II went so far as to reverse without compensation all lands transfers that had occurred in Anatolia since the reign of Romanus I. Basil's compensatory requisitions effectively broke the power of several great families, such as the Pocai and Scriari, while others simply withdrew from political and retired to their pastoral estates, Basel's lands reforms, while noble in the sense they aimed to protect the smallholder against the greed of the magnates, did little to actually improve the security of the empire. Smallhold former soldiers were both militarily and economically ineffective, while his lands confiscation so alienated the Anatolian aristocracy that many would throw off their allegiance to the states the moment he died. In contrast to Anatolia, Rumelia was rich and fertile and because it was not subject to the same rigorous military settlement or land holding structures, there was a diversity of investment. It was not long before an obvious economic imbalance between the East and West began to develop, leading the emperors to ignore the interest of the isolations, Anatolian magnates and devote more and more attention to the West. Although this Komneni were themselves members of the Anatolian aristocracy, once they were in power, they were quick to realize that their real economic interest lay in the West. The protection of the empire's Western interest is a consistent policy that runs through the reigns of Alexius, John II and Manuel. By contrast, Andronicus Komnenus spent his life in Anatolia in either Byzantine and Seljuk service, so his antipathy towards his predecessors Western oriented policies are perhaps easier to understand. The system of land use in Byzantine Anatolia was also a key factor assisting the Turkish conquest. As horse and sheep herding required less manpower than smallhold farming, the creation of great pastoral estates led to the displacement of the peasantry and general depopulation of the plateau. To the original Turkmen raiders, they virtually undefended great estates and their immense herds of livestock were targets too attempting to ignore. As they plundered their way across Anatolia, the scattered population fled westwards or the cities and coasts, virtually abandoning the plateau to the Turks.
The economic impact of this loss was not as great as might have been expected, as the central government had long lost its ability to collect taxes from and enforce its authority over the Anatolian Magnetis. The areas of real agricultural prosperity, the coastal districts and the rich farmland of Bithynia and the Mender Valley remained in Byzantine hands. The lack of clearly defensible borders made it difficult for the Byzantines to defend their remaining territory during the early years of Turkish conquest. However, the bandits and cattle rustlers who made up the first wave of Turkish raiders had neither the resources nor inclination to besiege cities and limited their activities to ravaging the countryside. The Turkish elite, such as the Kutalami, who entered Anatolia after massacred, however, fully understood the economic value of towns and cities, but they also lacked the resources to undertake a fully-fledged campaign of conquest. The cities that did fall to the Turks by conquest were the consequence of neglected defense and poor leadership. In most cases, however, once it became clear that the Turks were in control of the countryside, cities voluntarily switched their allegiance to the Turks usually with the city administration remaining intact. It was common practice for individual cities to change their allegiance this way during war. It had happened during both the Persian invasion 615 AD and the Arab conquest of 637 AD. What is surprising in this instance is that the Byzantine government itself assigned several cities to the Turks to administer on their behalf. In 1078 AD, when Nikephoros Botanetes left his base in Nicaea to claim the throne, he assigned the city along with Suzicus, Nicomedia, Calchedon, and Chrysopolis to Salema to garrison and administer it as his vassal. The generally peaceful transfer of power that occurred in Western Anatolia prevented a re re recurrence of the phys physical and economic devastation that had occurred in Armenia and ensured an alignment of interests between the Byzantines and the Turkish elites. There was surprisingly little disruption to the normal plateaus of Anatolian trade. The, pr the productions of the plateau, plateau, now in Turkish hands, still traveled to mar markets on the Byzantine coast. Byzantine coinage remained an official tender and the Seljuk economy remained closely integrated with the Byzantium. Only during the reign of Mesut did the Seljuk begin striking bronze coins for local use. Gold and silver coinage did not appear until the 13th century. The Byzantine Turkish Condominium The 1081 AD peace treaty between Alexis and Suleiman was of far greater import than simply establishing a Byzantine Seljuk border and normalizing trade relations, for it actually established a place for the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome within the Byzantine Ecumene. All Byzantine emperors from Michael Dukas to Nikephoros Botanetis to Alexis Komnenos were to some degree in debt to him for his support and rewarded him with money, lands and titles. It was natural therefore that Suleiman found it in his interest to align with the Byzantines rather than with the great Seljuks of Iran, who increasingly regarded him as a threat. It is possible Suleiman was influenced by the many Byzantine officials who occupied positions in his court, who could who would have undoubtedly stressed the benefits of maintaining good relations with the emperor. At any rate, it seems certain that Suleiman accepted protectorate status from the Byzantines. In return for his fealty, Alexius conferred on Suleiman the title Sultan, a title he may have adopted unofficially but had no legitimate claim to. Malik Shah certainly did not recognize Suleiman as Sultan and would have him regarded such a claim as treasonous. Suleiman's official title was Beyler Bey, or Chief of Chiefs, a rank akin to first amongst equals. In 1086 AD, Suleiman's ambition turned against the great Seljuks and he led an expedition into Syria but was defeated and killed. Alexius exploited the chaos that followed Suleiman's death to recover some border fortresses and solidify his hold on Western Anatolia, but he did not have the resources to embark on a campaign of reconquest. The great Seljuk Sultan Malik Shah was not unhappy with the apparent disintegration of the Rome Sultanate. He still felt that suzerainty over, over all Seljuks was his by right and in, in 1090 AD he made Alexis an extraordinary offer. In exchange for a peace treaty and marriage alliance, the Sultan would withdraw all Seljuk forces from Anatolia and restore all Byzantine lands lost in since massacred. It may have been a tempting offer but Alexis refused. Publicly, Alexis could not consent to a marriage between his, his Christian daughter and a Muslim 
While politically, the status of Rome was a useful, useful buffer between Byzantium and the much more powerful great Seljuks, it was important, therefore, that Alexius maintained his alliance with the Rome Seljuks, whilst continuing the, to exploit their disorder to his own advantage. He must also have realized Malik Shah's authority did not extend to the Turks of Anatolia, and few, if any, would have obeyed his call to withdraw, and even if they did, they would simply leave a gap gaping power vacuum in their wake. Most importantly, Alexis was dependent on Turkish military manpower, and without them he would not have little to contribute to the alliance. Malik Shah repeated the offer again in 1092 AD but died before he received Alexis' second refusal. The same year, Suleiman's 13-year-old son Kalaj Aslan escaped from exile in Isfahan and made his way to Nisiya. Alexius came out in, in support of Kilij Aslan's claim to the Sultanate. They signed a peace treaty and campaigned together against the Emir of Smyrna, Sakas, who had proclaimed himself emperor. Whatever hope Alexius had of maintaining his influence over Kilij Aslan were quickly dashed. The young Sultan proved to be a strong and capable leader and quickly reasserted his authority over his rebellious emirs. He then led his army against the Byzantines and soon recovered the fortresses that Alexius had recently recaptured. Threatened with the potential collapse of the Byzantine position in Western Anatolia, Alexius turned to the Normans for assistance. What he ended up with, however, was a crusade. The Byzantines had been battling with Muslims for centuries, but concept of crusade or holy war was completely alien to them. Nevertheless, Alexius used the, crusad the crusaders to recover Nicaea, Kalish Aslan's erstwhile capital from the Turks and clear a passage to Antalya. Alexius' treatment of the Turkish garrison of Nicaea is revealing, offering them a choice to live with all of their movable positions or to stay and accept a commission into Byzantine service. Kalish Aslan resettled in Iconium and despite his defeat soon restored good relations with Byzantium, both the Byzantines and the Seljuks of Rome remained aloof from the crusading phenomenon. The Rome Seljuks never offered assistance to their Syrian cousins, while the Byzantines often aligned with the Seljuks against the Crusaders. Alexius' policy of maintaining cordial byzantine rome Seljuks relations seems to have finally paid off when Kilish Aslan's son and successor Shah Shah formally accepted Byzantine federate status in 1116 AD. Unfortunately, it proved short-lived as Shah Shah was overthrown and assassinated shortly afterwards. But even though Shah Shah's brother Mesut I was determined to exercise Seljuk independence, Byzantine Seljuk affairs continued to remain aligned. Manuel I Komnenus, allied with Mesut against the transiting armies of the Second Crusade in 1146 AD, and later intervened in the succession crisis that followed Mesut's death, accepting the fealty of his son and successor Kalish Aslan II. Like his namesake, Kalish Aslan proved to be a dangerous and unreliable vassal. He regularly broke his arrangements with Manuel whenever it seemed advantageous to do, do so. A military demonstration by Manuel was usually sufficient to draw Kalish Aslan back to the negotiating table. Kalish Aslan even attended Manuel in Constantinople and was treated as an honored guest. Nevertheless, in 1175 AD, after continued breaches of the treaty, Manuel II led an army against Iconium but overreached himself and was defeated at Mediusophalum. Even though Manuel's defeat significantly undermined the Byzantine position in Anatolia, Kilish Aslan imposed no harsh terms and Byzantine Seljuk affairs quickly returned to normal. Even a decade later, Eustatius, the Archbishop of Thessalonica, could still write of the Seljuk Sultan Kilish Aslan as an ally of the Byzantine and defender of the interests of the younger Emperor Alexius II. Sovereignty and identified in the Byzantine Ecumene. The Byzantines were a deeply spiritual people. In their worldview, the Imperium Romanorum or Ecumene was the center of cosmic empire, eternal and indivisible. The empire's fortunes rose or fell upon the will of God. God chose to chastise the Byzantines with wars and defeats, or crown them with victories according to his will. This cosmology, cosmology allowed the Byzantines to constantly adjust their worldview to accommodate the loss of reacquisition of territory. Control of territory was therefore less important than the recognition of the emperor's place in the divine order. In the Byzantine universe, the emperor was God's wise regent on earth and protector of the Ecumene, or civilized world. 
Those outside the Ecoimene was either barbarians or rebels against the divine order. So while the Seljuks may have defeated the Byzantines in battle and seized their ter ter territories in an Anatolia, Suleiman's recognition of the emperor's authority allowed the Byzantines to incorporate the Seljuks within the Ecoimene or at least maintain the fiction that Anatolia had been restored to the Romans. The fact of the Seljuks incorporation into the empire is highlighted by the descriptive clarifications appended to Suleiman's title of Sultan. Ethnicity was irrelevant in the multi-ethnic empire that was Byzantium. Anna Komnana might call the Turks barbarians, but it was a term she also used to describe the Normans, Italians and Franks. To be considered a Byzantine, one needed to accept Orthodox Christianity and have an appreciation for civilized culture, that is, classical literature, order, rule of law and other such amenities of civilization. Accepting the Turks as Foderativas, the first step in a longer process aimed at transforming them from barbarians into Byzantines, much as the Byzantines had transformed the pagan Slavs, Bulgarians and Russians before them. Even the Turks' Islamic faith was not considered an insurmountable obstacle to their hoped integration as the Turks in the 11th century did not distinguish greatly between Islam and Christianity. The Rome Seljuks placed no restrictions on the Christians within their territories. This was significant as many Byzantine officials occupied key posts at such courts. Some, such as Philoretus' son, converted to Islam, but this was not a requirement. Many Byzantines stayed true to their Christian faith and this does not seem to have hindered their career. Indeed, the Rome Seljuks recognized the right of the Patriarch of Constantinople to exercise full ecclesiastic authority over the Orthodox Christians within their territories despite having a rival patriarch under their control of Antioch. Islam was however an obstacle for advancement for those Turks who entered Byzantine services and many regularly converted to Christianity, at least nominally. While the Orthodox authorities remained suspicious of Turkish converts, Manuel Komnenos took a pragmatic approach and attempted to encourage conversion by making the process as simple as possible. Unfortunately, clerical opposition thwarted his plans and, as the 12th century drew to a close, the Seljuks began to realign themselves with the Islamic ulema. Although incorporating significant Byzantine and Persian influences, in the end, Turkish culture provided proved its, its resilience. Both Christians and Islamic travelers were to comment on the distinctly Turkish culture of Turkey as Anatolia came to be called. The Mythologizing of Manzikert History is rarely about what actually happened, but more about how events are interpreted. For Michael Athletes and the Armenian cleric Vardapet, Manzikert was a disaster and they described it as, it as such. For Michael Psellus, Manzikert was a convenient misfortune and he described it as such. Quote, after his cursory, I told you so, description of Romanus' downfall at, after Manzikert, Psellus moves directly on the panegyric of the Ducas family and paints a picture of the empire at peace with itself and its neighbors. End of quote. By the time Anna Komnena wrote her history in 1148 AD, Manzikert was recognized as an important key historical event, but it had not become the disaster of later legend. Quote, the barbarians had gone unchecked from the time when they invaded the empire soon after Diogenes' elevation to the throne and his eastern campaign, which was ill-starred from the very beginning, right down to my father's reign. The implication being the Alexius had checked the Turks. Anna's, uh, Anna's assessment was somewhat optimistic as the Turks were now a permanent fixture in the Anatolia, that she did not use John II's inability to dislodge the Turks as opportunity to slander her hated brother suggests she failure of Alexis' Eastern policy, as end of quote. The Byzantines themselves seem not to have imbued Manzikert with any great significance. For them, their defeat and decline were simply God's punishments for their sins. It was later, with the rise of modern secular history, that people began searching for an identifiable, identifiable event that would mark the beginning of the decline. Thanks to Michael Atalaitis' mythologizing of Romanus and his doomed campaign and the triumphalism of later Arab historians, Manzikert had taken on the necessary romantic qualities to become that terrible day. None of this was necessarily true. The real causes of the loss of Anatolia were far more diverse, diverse and had little to do with the battles and conquests. Although this did occur, 
and were, were in their own way significant. The political and ethnic transformation of Anatolia was a much more complex process and can be summarized as follows. Byzantium's military success during the 10th century eroded both the internal and external defenses of the empire, allowing them decline of the thematic armies and city fortifications were per permissible if the empire was able to maintain the offensive capabilities of the Byzantine army. But this was neither economically nor politically possible in the long term. The decision to conquer and directly administer territories in Armenia, Mesopotamia and Syria was a strategic error that removed natural buffer states and overextended the military resources of the empire. Given that the central government was demonstrably unable to control the magnates on its own territory, the incorporating of large non-assimilated populations in the empire created significant problems of policing and governance that the Byzantines were ill-equipped to cope with, the, uh, with at that time. Basil II's failure to adequately plan for succession invited political disorder after his death, resulting in two key developments detrimental to the state. Firstly, the Anatolian magnates, who Basil had antagonized during his lifetime, either withdrew entirely from the political process or else used their influence to restore and extend their privileges. Secondly, the general polit political instability of the period encouraged the growth of a strong but generally corrupt and self-serving civil administration. No, none of Basil's immediate successors had either the strength, the ability, or the legitimacy to prevent these developments. As the central government's authority disintegrated during the 1060s and 70s, it was forced to dramatically reduce its expenditure. As the largest single expense in the Byzantine budget, the military bore the brunt of the budget cuts. These cuts proved untenable given the extended borders the military had to police and defend. And as the central government proved increasingly unable to secure the interests of the provinces or protect them from raiding, the provinces broke down in rebellion and separatism. Romanus Manziger's campaign was tactically sound if he was aiming to strike a blow against the great sages of Iran, but it completely failed to solve the problem of Turkmen raiding which could only be addressed by providing additional resources to the local garrisons. Nevertheless, having chosen to attack the wrong enemy, Romanus fought a textbook action at Manzikert and was only defeated by poor intelligence and treasury. The majority of the Byzantine army escaped intact, however, and Romanus managed to secure an equitable peace treaty from the Sejus. After Manzikert, Byzantine separatism was allowed to run its destructive course. Had the empire been better run and the civil war, war not occurred, a coordinated defense against Turkish raiding may have diverted the Seljuks back towards Fatimid Egypt. For a variety of reasons, the Byzantines did not recognize the Turks as a long-term threat. The Seljuks who conquered Anatolia had little or no centra centralized political structure and were undisciplined and fractious, likely as not to attack each other as the Byzantines. Nor were the Seljuks an unstoppable, unstoppable military force. After Manzikert, the Georgians expanded their territory at the Seljuks' expense, as did many of the Armenian principalities of Cilicia. The Byzantines, however, were more interested in fighting challengers to the throne than rebelling, repelling the Seljuks. As Anatolia broke apart in disorder, the Turks began to exercise an increasingly important role in Byzantine politics. Sultan Suleiman variously assisted the Byzantine central government or rebellious magnates to his advantage by the time Alexis Komnenos secured the Byzantine throne, the Seljuks occupied the entire Anatolian plateau. From the central government perspective, the economic loss of the Anatolian plateau was not as significant as it might appear. Given the amount of territory lost, as it had long ago lost control of those territories, it was therefore sensible policy to concentrate the government's limited resources on the defense of Western Anatolia and Rumelia. The repopulation of Anatolia and the subsequent revi revival of the several deserted Byzantine cities under the Rome Seljuk provided a stimulus to the Byzantine economy, at least in the short term. Cut off from its traditional Armenian recruiting grounds, the Byzantine army was quick to utilize the Turks as an abundant supply of available military manpower. By the 11th century, the Byzantine army was completely dependent on Turkish manpower and would remain so until the 14th century.
To a great extent, the Sultanate of Rum owed its existence to the Byzantines. Byzantines occupied positions in the Rum court and helped guide and structure its administration and least in the early decades. The Byzantines conferred legitimacy on its rulers and recognized the state's borders and positions. Sultan Suleiman enjoyed good relations with Michael Dukas, Nikephorus Botanatus, Nikephorus Melisenus, and Alexius Komnenus, and was generally a good ally to the Byzantines throughout his life. If Suleiman's successors were less reliable vassals, this was simply because they were in a port position, put Seljuk's interests ahead of their relationships with the Byzantines. Despite occasional conflicts, Byzantium and the Rum Sultanate enjoyed unusually close relations throughout their existence. There was a constant exchange of personal and personalities between their respective societies and, surprisingly, considering their religious differences, regular intermarriage. Both states provided sanctuary and employment for others' exiles and adventures, such as the future Emperor Michael Palaiologos, who, com who commanded a Byzantine contingent in Sultan Kai Kuwa's army in the 12th century. This constant exchange of personal and culture between Byzantium and Seljuk Rome ensured that the interests of their respective elites were, if not always aligned, at least understood. Nevertheless, Byzantine endeavors to acculturalize the Rome Seljuks, who in the 11th century at least were only vaguely Islamic, were half-hearted and hampered by religious and political arrogance. The Byzantine failures to impress the culture on the Rome Seljuks made it inevitable that they would eventually re realign with the Islamic world. Finally, the Seljuks' use of Byzantine coinage, while important symbolically, permanently disrupted the empire's carefully balanced economic cycle. The Byzantines had very limited gold reserves and so carefully regulated the circulation of gold nomisma within their economy. All taxes had to be paid in currency which guaranteed that most coinage circulated through the economy but ultimately returned to the treasury. Unless politically sanctioned, gold exports were strictly prohibited. The Sech court, however, became a significant consumer of coinage, which over time eroded Byzantium's gold reserve. The significance of this cannot be overstated and over time was probably more damaging to Byzantium's long-term viability than any loss of territory.